stroke, infections, congenital problems, um, lack of oxygen at birth, and so on. But the vast majority of epilepsy they felt then was what's called idiopathic. Idiopathic is a fancy medical term that means we don't know. <laughs> so it now turns out that in the subsequent 40 years that much of what was thought to be idiopathic we now know is genetic. Okay. So uh, when I say genetic, I mean that genes that you were born with, that you inherited from your parents and that you pass on to your children. There are some other genetic conditions that are due to acquired genetic mutations that you were not born with, but that develop either um, after conception or later in life. I'm not gonna be talking about those today. So if we look at that 75% of epilepsies which have a genetic component, that can then be further subdivided into what we call single gene epilepsies, which are also sometimes called Mendelian epilepsies in honor of Gregor Mendel, who was the man who really started to identify concepts of single gene and inheritance with the pea plants at the monastery. Um, there are also epilepsies that have what we call complex inheritance. That means it's not just one gene causing epilepsy, but the combination of perhaps a smaller effect of several genes, and sometimes with important environmental triggers. And then finally, there are what I would call weak genetic effects for some epilepsies, where you could have a change in a gene or a mutation in a gene, but you may not develop epilepsy. And so that's dependent, so those are what we call modifier alleles, meaning there has to be some other factor present, or just susceptibility alleles, which increase the risk, but again, do not guarantee epilepsy. So if we kind of think about diseases as being on a spectrum from purely environmental or um, nurture, and on the other end of the spectrum being purely genetic or nature, um, epilepsy crosses the whole spectrum, right? So there are clearly are epilepsies that are you wouldn't have had them if you hadn't been in that motor vehicle accident and had that head trauma at the environmental end. And then there are epilepsies which are purely genetic, so those monogenic or Mendelian forms of epilepsy, for example, in tuberous sclerosis. But we also know that many epilepsies are in between, right, with some complex inheritance or some genetic component, such as a predisposition to febrile seizures, but the seizure doesn't actually happen until and unless you have a fever at the right age when your brain is susceptible to febrile seizures. So the take home point of the first part is that about five to 10% of epilepsy is strongly genetic. And this is the part, this is the type of epilepsy for which geneticists like myself can be the most helpful and useful to patients and to their uh, treating physicians. So how do we actually do genetic epilepsy testing in the clinic? Again, it's complicated. <laughs> so um, on the left there, I just want to show you kind of an overview. Ah, I have this, okay. So this basically is an overview of, on this axis, genetic variation. So that we know that genetic variation can be very tiny, a single letter out of three billion letters in your genome, which is all of your DNA, up to changes of an extra or missing whole chromosome, which is clearly millions of bases of DNA. And again, there are genetic variants that are in between. On this axis, this shows that single nucleotide polymorphisms or really tiny DNA variants are very common in the population. Copy number variants, which means extra or missing pieces of DNA, not so common and bigger. And then rarer, like whole chromosome uh, differences in DNA are actually quite rare and cause conditions such as Down syndrome, trisomy 18 and trisomy 13. So in parallel with understanding that genetic variation is complex and of different sizes, we also need to have many different tools in order to test genetic variation. So for SNP or single nucleotide polymorphism, polymorphism variants, we can do G what's called genotyping. For variants that are in the range of a thousand to a million bases, we can do things like array comparative genomic hybridization. We can do sequencing of up to several thousand base pairs, 
and we can use karyotyping or chromosome analysis, which we've had for more than 50 years, to look at whole chromosome differences. The newest technology in genetic um, testing is called next generation sequencing or massively parallel sequencing. So this is just an overview to give you an indication that way back in 2001 when people were working on the Human Genome Project, so the effort to map and sequence all human genes and understand their relevance to human disease, it took a decade and cost more than $100 million to sequence one person's DNA. Okay, so over the subsequent time, with the advances of massively parallel sequencing, the cost of genetic sequencing has dropped dramatically. Um, and so now we're in this range here where it's possible to sequence someone's entire genome for somewhere between $5,000 and $10,000. That's absolutely remarkable and has really given us much greater access to a technology that 10 years ago was not feasible or possible from a financial point of view or in terms of the amount of time that it would take. Okay. So again, to make the point that epilepsy genetic testing is not one test, but it is many potential or possible tests. So we now have a whole range of genetic tests, testing options available to us in the clinic from testing of a single or a few genes. So for example, if a patient comes to see me and I really think that they have tuberous sclerosis, I'm not gonna test 100 genes. I'm gonna just test them for tuberous sclerosis. If I think that the patient has neurofibromatosis type two or schwannomatosis, again, I know what those genes are and I would limit testing to those genes because that's what makes sense for that patient. Next generation sequencing has allowed the advent of multiple gene testing, which are often called panels. And what that means is simultaneously testing somewhere between 10 and several hundred genes. So there are a number of genetic testing companies now that actually offer panel testing for epilepsies. And these usually tend to be centered around specific types or ages of onset of epilepsies. The next level of testing is what we call exome sequencing. And what that means is using next generation sequencing sequencing technology to test all of a patient's genes. So we're talking now 20,000 genes. Remember though, most of those genes are not gonna have anything to do with epilepsy. And that kind of testing gives you the potential to find out, for example, that the patient is at risk for completely unrelated conditions that they had no idea. So we call those secondary findings in genetics. For example, you could send an exome uh, exome sequencing for a patient to try to diagnose their epilepsy, but the results could come back all normal for all of the epilepsy genes, but that patient has a mutation in BRCA1. And so now you have to tell them that you're at, you know, 85% lifetime risk of breast cancer and 50% lifetime risk of ovarian cancer. And if it's a boy, then did he get it from his mother? See what I'm saying? And then she's at risk also. So the implications of genetic testing can be very serious and often go well beyond the patient. We have the technical ability to do a whole genome analysis or instead of sequencing the one to 2% of the genome that codes for genes, actually sequencing all three billion base pairs. Again, that's technically feasible now. It's being done now. Um, I can tell you as a practicing clinical geneticist that no insurance company covers this right now <laughs> as a diagnostic test. Um, and I actually think that that's reasonable because we don't know what to do with a lot of the information, particularly in the non-coding regions of the genome. For copy number variation uh, testing, I've already mentioned karyotype and microarray. And again, it's important to recognize that these technologies are not necessarily overlapping and that use of some technologies will miss certain diseases. And particularly, sometimes we need to employ other genetic methodologies such as methylation testing or looking for chromosomal inversions or trinucleotide repeats, which are not detected by any of the other technologies. So to summarize this part of the talk, uh, this is sort of an overview or big, uh, big picture of current options for genetic testing. So if you suspect a, a specific diagnosis for a patient with epilepsy, for example, they've had a family member who's had testing, and so you actually know what to look for. Again, you can do limited testing for just one gene or maybe two genes. 
if the, um, particularly if a child has a complex picture of epilepsy and other medical problems, such as congenital malformations or birth defects, autism, uh, growth um, failure to thrive, and so on, then it may actually be a good time to, to employ a tool like array comparative genomic hybridization or a gene panel. And again, if the picture is even more complicated than that, then that may be a good um, indication to do whole exome sequencing. So in addition to the vast variation in um, genetics, in, in terms of um, the variants that we have in genes, it's also important to recognize that uh, genetic variants can actually have differences in their effect. So we know, for example, that it's typically the rare alleles that cause uh, monogenic conditions, whether that's epilepsy or something else, and common variants tend to contribute relatively small effects to common diseases. And again, epilepsy spans the whole spectrum from very rare epilepsy syndromes to very common uh, epilepsy conditions. So uh, as far as medical genetics, um, genetics, of course, is a science is a specialty of science and basically studies heredity and uses genetic information to understand the basis of individual variation, whether it's between people or between dogs or plants or so on. All of that variation, that rich variation that you see often has a genetic basis. Medical genetics is a specialty of medicine and deals with the biologically, the bi biologically important genetic variation that is relevant to human health and disease. So again, it's taking that science of genetics, but applying it to people and current medical problems. So on the bottom here, I actually have uh, photos of a few children with well-known genetic conditions. So on the left is uh, two children with Hutchinson-Guilford syndrome or childhood onset progeria due to mutations in the lamin A gene. Uh, in the middle is a little girl with Down syndrome who has an extra copy of chromosome 21. And on the right is a little boy with um, albinism. So he has less pigment to his hair and his eyes, uh, and that's a recessive condition. So um, what are some of the red flags for considering whether a person with epilepsy has a genetic basis for their epilepsy and who should consider a genetic evaluation? So these are some of the uh, general clues that we use. So clearly, if there are a lot of people in the family who have epilepsy, it could be on a genetic basis. The second is that uh, epilepsy that typically starts earlier in life is more strongly genetic than epilepsy that starts, let's say, after the age of 50. Um, epileptic encephalopathies, or the very early childhood infantile epilepsies, are more likely to be genetic as a group of disorders. And then, again, the combination of epilepsy with other findings or other medical problems um, is a type of epilepsy that's more likely to be genetic. And then, finally, epilepsy with metabolic abnormalities, and what I mean by that is changes in blood or urine chemistry that suggests potentially a biochemical um, disorder that's causing epilepsy and something else. Uh, and I just wanted to spend a few seconds here on brain developmental disorders because they, uh, again, overall are a rarer cause of epilepsy, but if you have a brain developmental disorder, then it's frequently genetic. And so these include things like lysencephaly or smooth brain, double cortex, polymicrogyria, periventricular heterotopia, holoprosencephaly, and tuberous sclerosis. So these are basically conditions that may present initially as epilepsy, may lead to an MRI. On the MRI, there could be a developmental brain malformation identified, and then the doctor could say, I think that this could be genetic, so let's go the next step and do genetic evaluation to find the cause and confirm that. So. Um, I'm a geneticist, and I will tell you that I think that many physicians are not well trained to provide genetic services, okay? So there was a survey of medical genetics course directors in medical schools of, in the U.S. and Canada, and this is a very recent survey, only two years old, and they said that only 26% of American medical schools, so about a quarter, 
are teaching genetics in the clinical years, so, so the third and fourth year of medical school. And again, that's when you take those basic principles and you learn how to apply them to patients and clinical situations. That means 75% are not really learning clinical genetics. And in addition, the total time that medical students in the United States now are spending is 36 hours on average. Um, up to 100 hours. So basically medical students are receiving less than one week full-time education to learn genetics, and that's just not enough. Um, I am a program director, which means that I'm training physicians who are residents to learn genetics and be board certified, and it takes us two years. Okay. This is actually another study that was published by a, pedi a uh, pediatric neurologist, Phil Pearl, who's now at Boston Children's Hospital, and they actually uh, developed a curriculum specifically to address whether medical students had knowledge of neurogenetics. So again, this is the part of genetics that would apply to neurological conditions. And uh, they found that um, when the students assess their own knowledge, okay, their, their own knowledge, only about, you know, 15% thought that their knowledge was excellent, which means that 85% assessed their own knowledge as being either minimal or maybe only basic or proficient. And when they actually tested the students on different concepts of genetics, although they had a good understanding of just basic uh, bread and butter principles of genetics that you learn in the first year, like autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-linked inheritance, when it came to actually using and interpreting genetic testing, that most, uh, that only about half of students got that right, so about a, a coin toss. And when it came to genetic counseling, which is again, interpreting the results for the patient in a clinical context, that 70% of them got them wrong. Okay, and only 30% got them right. So that's pretty scary. Um, and that's why I think that uh, it is important to consider, if you have a genetic evaluation, to consider working with an actual clinical geneticist. Okay. And this is an article that was published last week in the Wall Street Journal. Um, and so this was basically a story about a boy who had sudden cardiac death and then his cardiologist started testing family members. They misused and misinterpreted the testing. They started testing other family members. They started getting pacemakers or ICDs, and then the family finded, finally ended up going to the Mayo Clinic for a second opinion, where they found that all of that testing was really based on a false assumption, because the, when they got DNA from the boy who actually passed away, he didn't have the genetic variant that they were thinking caused the problem in the first place. Okay, and uh, the, the doctor who's highlighted here, I just wanna say, is not a geneticist, he's a cardiologist, but he is a world expert in this field of cardiac genetics, okay? And again, I don't wanna imply that uh, no neurologists understand genetics because clearly there are some neurologists who are also leading experts when it comes to neurogenetics or epilepsy genetics. All I'm saying is that Neurologists are trained and board certified to practice neurology, um, the medical specialty of people who have problems with their uh, brain and nervous system. You know, epilepsy specialists have done additional training beyond that, right, in order to take care of patients with epilepsy and have special expertise and knowledge in that field. And similarly, geneticists have gone on and done extra training to be expert in their field of endeavor. So again, this is a big surprise to most people that I talk to because they don't even know there is a specialty of medical genetics. Um, but medical geneticists are the physicians who have board certification in evaluation of genetic diseases and the use and interpretation of genetic testing. And medical genetics and genomics, just like epilepsy and like other fields of medicine, is changing very, very fast. So even if you learned genetics several years ago during medical school or residency, your knowledge is probably out of date today. And the only thing that I can make a comparison to really between how fast genetics is changing is cell phone technology. So this was uh, from the movie Wall Street in the 1980s with Michael Douglas and compare his cell phone with, again, what we have today. So uh, I am the director of the Medical Genetics Clinic at the University of Washington. And again, uh, this is, I would say, a well-kept secret, even though it's been there since 1959. Um, we actually have the largest genetics clinic in the United States, and therefore probably the world, for adults. 
We see over 2,500 patients per year, and it started from a very small clinic by Dr. Arno Matelski, who founded the division in 1957. Um, we see all types of genetic conditions in adults, including cancer genetic predisposition, neurogenetics, connective tissue disorders, and so on. This is a recent uh, photo of our clinic staff. Uh, and five of our physicians have been chosen by their peers as being top doctors in Seattle Magazine or Seattle Metropolitan Magazine, including this year me. Hi. So um, to summarize this part, medical genetics is recognized to be increasingly important in many areas of adult medicine. Um, and some of you may know the story of Angelina Jolie, for example, who underwent BRCA1 and 2 genetic testing. Hank Gathers, who was a, a brilliant college basketball player who died suddenly and was found to have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a genetic condition that affects about 1 in 500 people. Um, and, or Jay Monahan, who is actually Katie Couric's husband, who passed away at a young age from colon cancer, which actually was a hereditary type of colon cancer. So uh, again, this is the stats for our clinic, and as you can see, it's growing very rapidly, and we have a major presence in the area in terms of offering cancer genetic services, as well as genetic evaluation for patients with neurologic conditions, uh, cardiovascular conditions, and others. So currently, we have um, 10 physicians seeing patients, six genetic counselors, and two patient support staff. On the pediatric genetic side here at Seattle Children's Hospital, they run independently from my clinic, but they're also a very large group of 14 physicians in genetics, two nurse practitioners, and four genetic counselors. So again, the role of the neurologist and the geneticist, I feel, in the evaluation of genetic epilepsies um, has some differences. So the neurologist clearly has training and expertise in the diagnosis of epilepsy. They can treat all epilepsies, whether they're genetic or not. They're expert in um, ordering and interpreting EEGs, MRIs, and of course they have a very um, good sense of the medications and the surgical options for treating epilepsy. Whereas the MD geneticist really is expert in taking and interpreting a family history, in evaluating whether uh, findings in other organ systems impact the diagnosis. They have much better familiar familiarity with the types and complexities of ordering and interpreting genetic testing. They are much more expert in genetic counseling and, again, understanding the implications of testing for other family members. Because in genetics, we really look at the family and not just the patient. So I think that epilepsy genetics, to summarize, needs teamwork. And oftentimes, because the neurologist has a better understanding of what kind of epilepsy it is and uh, the localization, I think interdisciplinary clinics like the one that's been started here at Seattle Children's Hospital, where neurologists and geneticists work together, is really the optimal care for the patient. So why do we try to identify the genetic basis of someone's epilepsy? So um, first of all is really for diagnosis. If you have a genetic diagnosis, that gives you a very specific, confirmed uh, basis for understanding why the epilepsy happened in the first place. Some people have been on what we call the diagnostic odyssey. In other words, there's no reason, no reason, no reason, and they ha end up having many, many tests to try to find out what caused the epilepsy in the first place. For some people, understanding the type of epilepsy at a molecular basis gives more, in, more detailed and specific information about prognosis for that person's epilepsy. In some cases, but not many at this point, it alters the treatment choices. Um, and oftentimes, if we make a specific genetic diagnosis, then we can give a very precise recurrence risk estimate for future children, for siblings' children, and other family members, and even um, genetic testing to help refine that further. So I just wanted to spend a minute on a case presentation. So this is a 20-month-old girl that I saw at Boston Children's Hospital who had both febrile and afebrile seizures. So she had normal development in the first year of life and then started having seizures both with fever and without. She had normal EEG and MRI, was treated with carbamazepine, and then presented with status epilepticus at the time of a febrile illness. MRI was repeated and, again, did not find a cause for her epilepsy at that age, and her EEG was quite abnormal with um, 
focal and generalized epileptic discharges. So here is um, her EEG, which as you can see is quite abnormal. <laughs> and this is her family history, which I took. So she was the youngest of four children in the family and there's no one else in the family with epilepsy. So this is not informative in terms of saying we see a pattern of epilepsy, but still epilepsy can be genetic even if only one person in the family has it. So these are some of the diagnostic studies that she went through. And as you can see, it's quite a long list. And then finally, I ordered uh, molecular genetic testing of SCN1A. And she was found to have a mutation that results in a shorter version of the protein. And so she has a diagnosis of Dravet syndrome. And in this particular case, it does have an implication for treatment because we know that children with Dravet syndrome typically do not respond to sodium channel blocking drugs. And she'd already been treated with one of those, right? So uh, this is a picture of a sodium channel. And so the mutation was in the alpha subunit here, which is the main pore forming um, structure that's encoded by this gene. So everybody, when I t give a talk to general audiences, uh, asks me about direct-to-consumer genetic testing. So uh, most of you have probably heard of 23andMe, which was founded by the wife of uh, one of the founders of Google. And um, basically what you do is you just mail away for a kit, comes to your house, you spit in a tube, you send it back, and then you can log in and get a report, right? Um, Three years ago, the FDA sent a cease and desist order to 23andMe because they said that they, weren't, they did not have a, a scientific basis for the reports they were writing. 23andMe has retooled and come back and is doing some limited uh, testing as well as giving ancestry information. But again, as a professional geneticist, in my opinion, I would say just say no to 23andMe. Okay. Uh, and I, again, this is not the point of this talk, but we have had patients come to the clinic with their 23andMe reports, and we have had some very serious um, bad outcomes from doing this. Okay. So in the last part of the talk, I want to uh, transition to the idea of genomic medicine, or basically using genetic information to improve health outcomes. And so this is what we call precision medicine. So I would say that for the past, um, since the beginnings of really genetics and its applications to medicine, that era I would call genetic medicine, okay? And again, that largely consists of looking at single genes and saying, how does that help us understand what the patient has? How does that help us identify pathways to study in basic science? Um, we are currently in the area in the era of genomic medicine, so we're transition, we've transitioned from genetic medicine to genomic medicine, or using large-scale genetic data to try to find a cause and to understand the implications of that for patients and their families. The next era is what we call precision medicine, or using the patient's genetic information, their personal individual genetic information, for disease prevention for some people, in the case of people who we know have a cancer predisposition, we can prevent them from getting that cancer in the first place. Um, as well as for diagnosis, genetics, your response to medications can also be genetically determined, and that we call pharmacogenetics, what medicines work for you or what medicines are liable to cause side effects, um, as well as tailored therapies, whether they're medical or surgical. So in some ways, we're thinking about like moving toward a genetics first approach and really doing genetic testing up front to have that information to guide treatment and prevention. So to s again, this is kind of like a 30,000 foot view. If we sort of look at genetics over the past hundred years or thousands of years, we've always known that some traits are inherited, right? Just looking around you, looking at your own family. Um, the science of genetics really started with understanding chromosomes and then single genes and how they intersect with diseases. So again, we're currently in this, uh, we're ending this era and we are beginning this era and I think this will be the next era. Okay. For people who are interested in a genetics evaluation after my talk, I've put down the contact information for the adult genetics clinic and the pediatric genetics clinic at Seattle Children's Hospital. And that's my last slide. <laughs> okay. I'd be happy to take some questions.
Um, now that you've educated us, I'm just wondering how educated are the insurance companies? <laughs> on? On trying to get, you know, if you want the real yeah. genetics okay. treat, tested, yes. instead of making you go through all the hoops, yes. the patient go through all the hoops with the ones that aren't really reliable or may not be as reliable, are they on board with you? Um, so that's a good question, and certainly genetics, uh, so almost always a genetic consultation in our clinic is a covered benefit that's paid by insurance. Okay. Some insurance companies actually have very clear guidelines about when they will cover the cost of genetic testing, including Medicare and Medicaid. So there is some genetic testing that is covered by pretty much all insurance, but I can tell you that, again, it tends to be limited to common conditions and a few genes because that's currently what the insurance companies understand. So for patients, because uh, again, I see patients every week, and so when patients come to us and I make a recommendation that I think genetic testing is indicated, then we often obtain a pre-authorization from insurance to see if it will be covered and what the copay and out-of-pocket cost to a patient would be. And again, we do that all the time, so I feel that we are much more have much more expertise in doing that and in dealing with the insurance companies than someone who is in private practice and maybe orders a genetic test once a month. <coughs> or once a year. Given that, <clears throat> given that the tests and the understanding or the interpretation of the data um, has changed so rapidly, what do you recommend for families who may have gotten inconclusive results, say, eight, nine years ago? How Come often back to genetics. Okay. <laughs> that, that's what we tell people because, again, if you had a negative genetic test result, then um, the technology may not have been the right technology at the time. And again, if you're interested and want to follow up, then come back to genetics. Once you have a genetic test done, how can you as a parent facilitate cooperation or that um, sharing of, of information and treatment between your neurologist and whatever genetic outcome happens. And I guess the underlying part of that is if you have a kiddo like me who has a slew of problems, including um, birth defects, autism, yeah. all sorts of things. Right. Coordinating care with all right. these different providers is a real challenge. It is. And um, so when I worked at Boston Children's Hospital, we actually had a complex care service, which was lovely. And so basically, the complex care service was a way to coordinate appointments among multiple different specialists. And so for, and one thing that helps actually is having a common medical record, right? So if you tend to, um, center the care at a place like a center of excellence that has all the different specialists that you need, then they will automatically be sharing information through their common medical record. The complex care service at Boston Children's Hospital, on top of that, had a nurse practitioner whose job it was to actually review the charts for these kids. And so, for example, if I had written in my note, I'd like to do a skin biopsy for specialized genetic testing, I might get a call from her and say, hey, I saw your note that you wanted to do a skin biopsy, and by the way, that child is going to be sedated next week for a colonoscopy. Would you like to do the skin biopsy then? Okay. So I think those, you know, those types of services are value added, but it, they're difficult to support. Does children's have that? Skin? Does children's have that? No. Not yet <laughs> is the answer. Okay. And I, that's my role, Fabulous. What's your name? Tanya Hammer. Tanya Hammer. Okay. Any other questions? If you found, um, I'm wondering if you found a link between other illnesses and epilepsy, like migraines, maybe. Epilepsy and migraines. Hmm. Let me think about that for a minute. Um, so there definitely are links between epilepsy and other conditions. Um, not thinking, migraine is not coming to the top of my mind as being one of them. Um, migraines can be due to channel disorders, and they're both, you know, episodic, right? Epilepsy and migraines, but I'm not thinking that there's really a strong genetic 
link between them. On the other hand, there certainly are families with um, inherited cardiac arrhythmias, right? And so those sometimes can be misinterpreted or misdiagnosed as epilepsy. And sometimes people can have both. So those things can be related. We also know that for people who have autism, the risk of epilepsy is higher, right? So those are comorbid conditions. Um, what, it, what is the form of the testing? Is it through blood? I know you said a skin biopsy. That's a good question. So most of our germline genetic testing, which again is the genes that you were born with, inherited from your parents, are the same all your life, we can do from a blood test. 